Previously, I showed you how to use this Ring Alarm keypad along with Home Assistant. This is such a great keypad, and for 20 bucks, it's a no-brainer to get. The only issue with this keypad is that it uses Z-Wave. If you only use Zigbee protocol, good luck finding a keypad in the US. The last option would be making our own keypad that works over Wi-Fi. I showed you previously how to do that with ESP Home and sniffing out the Wigan codes. In that video, the ESP chip was installed in the basement while the keypad was outside. Today, we'll apply the same concept to this keypad that we can certainly use indoor as well as outdoor. For this application, for an upcoming client, I'll be actually using this indoor and installing it on his bookshelf. Here it is compared to a $1 bill, so you can see how big it is or how small it is. The keypad uses the Wigan standard, so all of these colors are standard too, as you will see later on. We need to pop the back cover off. I'm using a really slim knife. Work on the edges right there where the knife is pointed at. Dig in and pry the back open. Once you pry the back open, this is what you'll see. There's a thin layer of epoxy coating to make it waterproof. Here's the speaker, by the way. If you don't care too much about the speaker, then you can certainly destroy it, crush it, or mute it as seen in my previous video. This speaker is shockingly loud and annoying, so I'll be muting it later on. We only need the black, which is ground, red for positive 12 volt, D, C power, white, and green. We can ignore all of the other colors for now. By the way, there's a cheat sheet to let you know what all the colors are. Looking at it from the bottom side, it is about two pencils thick. Here's a screw hole to secure it to the back plate when you are ready to mount it to the wall. All screws and plastic anchors are provided to mount to a wall. To do that, first mount the black back plate onto a wall. Then slide the keypad in from the top and secure it firmly to the back plate via the small bottom screw. Getting this to work with home assistance is relatively easy. I'm using a 12 volts DC power adapter. It loops around and goes into this buck converter to convert this from 12 volts DC out to 5 volts DC. The 5 volts DC will power up this ESP32C3 chip that uses 5 volts. On this side, the 12 volt side, I'm also splitting out to feed the keypad 12 volt DC power. On the buck converter, there's a tiny screw. Use a small Phillips screwdriver to adjust the output to 5 volts. Use a multimeter to confirm the output is indeed 5 volts. Otherwise, you might fry the ESP32 chip. Since we're not using any of the other wires like the gray, the purple and blue, I snip all of the ends off just to make sure that they won't touch each other. Also, the less clutter we have in this tight space, the better. Later on, I actually removed this white plastic piece to make even more space. As mentioned before, we only care about the D0 and D1, which is the white and green. That feeds into the GPIO5 and 4. The keypad is about two pencils thick, which is plenty of thickness to hide the two chips and wiring. Once you're done squeezing everything, including tucked wires and cover the back plates, all that's sticking out is just this black wire for power. That's easy to hide on the bookshelf for the client. For testing purposes, I'm using this super short black wire. You can make it as long as you want. I'm using DuPont's connectors, but you can certainly solder all the connections if that's more convenient for you. I should mention that when you receive the buck converter and ESP32 chip, none of the metal terminals are there. I soldered the terminals in to work with the DuPont connectors. By the way, if this video is helpful, please consider subscribing and liking the video. This lets YouTube know my video is indeed helpful and will recommend to others like yourself. Once you're done with all of the wiring with the hardware, go ahead and open up your home assistant. On the left hand side, click on ESP Home, click on New Device, Continue. Name it whatever you want. Click on Next. This is the ESP32C3 model. I'm going to skip encryption key. Find your new ESP home device. For our example, it's Touchpad Wiegand. Click on Edit. If you're not familiar with YAML code, please refer to this previous video for the basics. And don't worry about pausing the video. I will share the code in the video description below. All you have to do is copy and paste. Let's jump into the main section, which is the Wiegand section. The ID, you can name it whatever you want. 
D0 is on GPIO number 4. D1 will be GPIO number 5. On key, we'll be reading the keys when you manually enter the digits on the numeric pad. On tag is when you're using the fob. It's pretty nice that they gave you 20 fobs in the package. You can see I've already scanned the fobs to get the numbers. Obviously, when you scan your own fobs, you will get the code, then enter it in here. Delete mine and insert yours. You can enter in as many codes as you want. Let's go down a little bit to Key Collector. This section is for the ESP chip to collect the entered digits whenever you enter it in. The minimum length that it will accept is 2. It could be 1 if you want. And the maximum length it will accept is 8. Again, you can change it to whatever you want. Once you hit the pound key, that will send all of the numbers in. Timeout is 5 seconds. So after 5 seconds, it will ignore everything that you've previously entered. I have only entered in two numbers for you to get started with. These correspond to two switches. The third number toggles a switch. I'm going to define these switches here and here. Once you're done editing the code, go ahead and click on Save. Click on Install. Manual Download. This will take a while, so now is a good time to get some ice cream. When it is done compiling, this is the option that it will give you. If you're going to use ESP Home Web, click on Factory Formats, and it will give you the bin file. Let's get the firmware onto the chip. If you've wired the ESP32 chip all up, then remove all the wires. I prefer flashing my chip bare bone, nothing attached to it yet. Connect the ESP32 chip to your Windows laptop or desktop using a USB-C cable. Make sure the USB-C cable supports data. If the USB-C cable does not support data, you'll see blinking blue LED light followed by red LED light. Open up Internet Explorer or Chrome. It cannot be Firefox. Open this URL web.esphome.io. Click on Connect. Go all the way down and find something that says something about serial. Mine is all the way down on the bottom. And then click on Connect. Click on Install. Choose File. We're going to find the bin file that we got earlier. And then click on Open. Click on Install. Once the firmware has been written to the chip, go ahead and disconnect it from your computer. Wire up everything as seen in this photo shown earlier and plug in the 12 volts DC adapter to power it up. You'll hear an annoyingly loud beep sound from the touchpad once it gets power. We're going to go into the Home Assistant, ESP Home, that you saw earlier. Click on Close because we have the bin file ready. There's no need for it. Let's go back into the Home Assistant. Click on the ESP Home tab. Go find your device. This one is the touchpad and it is indeed online. That's good. Let's go to Settings Integration. Looks like it found the device, so let's click on Reconfigure or Add. If you don't know what your encryption key is, go ahead and go back into the ESP Home tab. Go down to your device, click on Edit. This is the encryption key in the API section. Let's find your newly integrated Wigan keypad within ESP Home. These are the toggle switches which we programmed earlier. Let's go back into the ESP Home section on the left hand side. Go to the device one more time. Touchpad Wigand. Click on Logs. Select Wirelessly. Let me resize all of the windows so you can get a better understanding. On the left hand side, you got the two switches that we defined. On the right hand side, we got the raw data that the ESP chip is reading from the keypads. From the YAM mall code, pressing 111 pound will toggle this switch right here to on. To turn off, I'm going to press 110 pound because that's how it's defined in the YAM mall code. If I enter gibberish like 2222, it won't do anything. But of course, it will still read the numbers that I entered in. Let's scan a fob. This fob was defined to toggle the switch. So every time I scan, it will toggle back and forth between on or off. Very nice. If you're not reading any numbers or the numbers look gibberish, it is possible that you have to force the keypad into Wigand 26 standard. I know that it says 34, but really it's 26. Luckily, the manual for this keypad was included to show you how to activate Wigand 
26-bit standards. On the keypad, press star. The programming password, which is 123456. That's the default password. Next, press pound, 031 pound. Personally, I find using ESP Home to control my locks so much better to add pins, add fobs, much more efficiently than using the access control software as seen in my other previous video. I guess if you are a big company, using special software to control access works. But for home users, ESP Home is more efficient to add, delete users without using any proprietary software. Once a legit pin is entered or once a legit fob is used, then ESP Home will send a code for Home Assistant to unlock or lock any doors or do whatever you want. For this client, he will use the touchpad to control his alarm panel to arm and disarm. Additionally, I will be setting up the lights as well as the garage door opener. Pressing 000 will open the garage, for instance. I think it's pretty slick that you can use this touchpad, this keypad, to control any devices you want by entering a two-digit number. All right, hopefully you found this video helpful. I really appreciate you guys subscribing to my channel, liking this video, and thanks for watching.